it's just great. So our next speaker is Megan Paul, who's a dietitian who's from Walgreens and Infusion Services, and will talk to us about nutritional needs in neuromuscular disease. Megan. Um, so I work for Walgreens Infusion Services where we service many patients that are on home tube feeding and home TPN, which is IV nutrition. So it does correlate pretty well to the disease, which I'll go through as we get further into the presentation. And I was invited to be part of the MDA clinic at the Northwestern team almost two years ago now, and it's been a wonderful experience. So the objectives for this presentation are to identify nutritional concerns and neuromuscular disease, particularly in the BMD population, treatment and prevention of identified nutritional concerns, the nutritional goals and maintenance and Becker muscular dystrophy. So what is nutrition? Based on the World Health Organization, it is the intake of food considered in relation to the body's dietary needs, good nutrition, and adequate well-balanced diet combined with regular physical activity is a cornerstone of good health. Poor nutrition can lead to reduced immunity, increased susceptibility to disease, impaired physical and mental development, and reduced productivity. So nutrition is extremely important. Okay, to start with the basics, nutritional components of food, we have the macronutrients and the micronutrients. Macronutrients are where we get the big core of our energy from, which is part of the carbohydrates, which also includes fiber, protein, fat, and water is a huge component of nutrition, although it doesn't provide energy, it provides a multitude of other benefits. Micronutrients would include vitamins and minerals. Vitamins also are broken down into fat soluble and water soluble. And then minerals, trace elements are involved in that as well, which would be like zinc, selenium, copper, those are needed in smaller amounts. This is the new food guide pyramid, which is now the My Plate. I'm not sure if anyone's had a chance to take a look at it. They're trying to get away from building blocks of a pyramid and get it to have it relate to your home and your actual plate, which you're having then at home. Um, and they show up the breakdown of carbohydrates and fruit. They want to separate just carbohydrates, um, which is fruit and grains. They want to separate it out so you're getting a smaller portion of each, vegetables, protein, and then dairy. So we'll begin with nutritional assessment. To determine nutritional needs or nutritional risk, we usually want to get a BMI of a patient, which is a measurement of body fat in relation to height and weight. It applies to both men and women. Um, typically, best designed for 18 to 65. It is a difficult measure for patients with a large lean body mass. And then it's also a difficult measurement for muscular dystrophy patients that have a leaner body mass. So it might show a severe malnutrition when they just have a smaller frame at this point. Um, and if it's difficult to determine height with contractures, you can always do an arm span if that's possible to determine a BMI. Mm -hmm. The way we classify BMI is 18.5 or less is considered underweight. 18.5 to 24.99 is normal. 25 to 29.99 is overweight. Then we get into the classes of obesity once we hit 30. 30 to 34.99 is one. 35 to 39.99 is class two, and then greater than four, we're considered more red obesity at that point. Another way to show measurement for a pediatric population is a growth chart. I just put up one particular growth chart up here, which is for a BMI for boys ages two to 20. Um, we're typically trying to search for ideal body weight at the 50th percentile where we determine an ideal body weight. And that's what we would base needs on after that. So nutritional concerns and Becker mus muscular dystrophy. A major concern is underweight. There's also overweight and obesity, constipation or just GI alterations, getting adequate calcium and vitamin D intake, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, steroid-induced insulin resistance or diabetes or hypoglycemia, and then cardiac disorders that would require nutritional management. So for underweight, what we would do to, de to determine it and what we would do to treat it, we would do the calculation of a BMI, or if it's a pediatric patient, I would use the growth chart. It's a little bit better measurement. Um, we're looking for anything below the 50th percentile for pediatrics. 
And then if the BMI is anything 18.5 or below, that's when we're going to start to get concerned for adequate nutrition. We'll also determine um, malnutrition based on weight loss. So it can also show a trend throughout clinics or throughout appointments. If you're seeing, um, you know, if you're going to appointments every three months and you've seen a 7.5 decrease in weight, that should be a trigger even if the BMI isn't necessarily an underweight BMI. We're going to want to pay a little bit more close attention and possibly get a dietitian um, or some nutrition counseling involved to prevent any further weight loss. Um, and then and to determine how we're going to treat that. It should always be individualized. There is a little algorithm that we use for calorie needs. It doesn't always apply to pediatrics. There's a much more specific chart, which I won't get into. But for adults, typically, if you want to maintain weight, you want to do about 25 to 30 kilogram calories per kilogram. If you want to gain weight, you want to do 30 to 35. And if you want to lose weight, 20 to 25. Morbid obesity can be as low as 10 calories per kilogram. That's a little method that we typically use, which doesn't always apply to everyone, so I'm just giving a method, but we would definitely want to get individualized for specific patients. Other concerns or reason that we should be concerned about underweight patients is that there's no reserve. So if they become ill, you obviously become very hypermetabolic when you have a fever, and you're not going to have much to lose at that point. You're also higher risk for decutibus ulcers or pressure ulcers if you're sitting often and your motility is decreased. Um, and these types of ulcers and wounds actually require more calories and more protein. And at that point, it's already a struggle. So that's definitely a concern. And then pressure ulcers also include extra vitamins and minerals, so you would have to add supplementation on top of that. Okay, next concern is the overweight obesity category. And that would be any BMI greater than 25. Growth charts, I would say a little bit above the 50th percentile, because at 50th, you're technically ideal body weight. So possibly at the 75th percentile, we might want to consider um, for pediatrics. And then again, I always want to do an individual weight loss goal for every patient. I don't want to put out, this is how many calories per kilogram, this is how much protein for that particular patient. Um, there's also an algorithm for that. And then the optimal goal is to go slow, about one to two pounds of weight loss per week. And then you want to achieve about a 10% weight loss at our goal. Factors that can increase weight gain is when patients become less immobile in, our, in their wheelchair. Um, steroid therapy can increase appetite and increase weight as a result. And just possible depression or different moods, we might turn to food, which is a good option when we're concerned about weight, but not if we're already having some factors that are contributing to weight gain. Um, and the issues with obesity that is a concern is that it's already, the already weak muscles are having a harder time carrying a little extra weight to go through life. And then it leads also to comorbid conditions. Comorbid conditions that we'd want to look at are type 2 diabetes. Um, that it would be as a result of the overweight obesity category and also steroid induced. It's just a side effect of steroids that's going to increase the blood pressure, increase insulin resistance. Um, so it's something we're going to have to look into on checkups either through diet therapy, possibly medication, um, but that's also going to be useful to prevent other microvascular diseases. And it actually helps with wound healing too. Whenever your blood sugar is in control, your body is functioning well and it's able to heal quicker. So nutrition counseling for that would be carbohydrate counting um, and going through all the specifics and balancing protein and fat to stay full and to also keep the blood sugars down from spikes which I can go into further if any of you questions later. Other comorbid conditions are cardiac disorders, um, also caused by obesity, also just a part of the disease itself, um, and then possibly congestive heart failure, which can be a little managed a little bit with nutritional management, such as fluid restrictions and sodium management. This really did not come up very well, but I was just trying to get an idea of part of counseling that I would do. I would show them areas to look at one of their purchasing foods on spending particular attention to the total carbohydrates. Some people get caught up on sugars, so always encourage to look at the total carbohydrates because that turns into glucose regardless once it's metabolized. Paying close attention to the fats, the saturated versus the unsaturated cholesterol. Came out a little blurry though. GI alteration, so constipation is a concern as well. If you're not eating much, you're not going to produce many bowel movements, and if you're not having enough fiber, that's also not going to produce a bulking amount to help you go regularly. And if you're not getting adequate fluids, then you definitely will be constipated. So we need to pay close attention that those um, concerns are being met. And then just immobility on its own can cause constipation. 
So something to think about. Treatment for that would be more nutrition counseling on foods that are high in fiber and also a heavy emphasis on fluid. You can definitely get a lot of food and a lot of fiber, but if you don't have fluid, it's not going to move. Okay. And then possibly they might actually have to be on stool softeners as well. Calcium and vitamin D concerns. Individuals with Becker muscular dystrophy are at high risk for orthopedic manifestations. So adequate calcium and vitamin D are important for bone health. Also, getting the excess of protein or too little protein or excess of sodium can increase losses of calcium and uh, urinary losses, so we do want to pay attention to that for bone health as well. Also, vitamin C, potassium, magnesium, and vitamin K have been shown to have some effect on bone health, so that would just include a healthy diet. There aren't specific guidelines for those, but something just to pay attention to that adequate nutrition in general is important for bone health as well, not just the calcium and vitamin D. For calcium, the minimum is about 1,000 milligrams daily with an upper limit of 2,500. 2, um, daily vitamin D, D needs can vary. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a minimum of 400 IUs of vitamin D for pediatrics. The upper limit is about 2,000. And it's important to know that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so if you do get an excess amount, it will show up toxic in the blood since it can be excreted through the urine, such as vitamin C and B vitamins. Um, so that's why there is an upper limit as well in the calcium, just for the toxicity in the bones. Um, I would say most adults probably need at least 800 to 1,000. If you have a deficiency, you want to start with 2,000. If you have a GI integrity issue, you really want to choose a really high dose to treat it and then check it within a month. And that would be individualized as well. Also, you want to think about seasons. If it's the winter, patients that don't even have issues with oral intake of calcium might have a little bit lower vitamin D level than the summer when we're getting some sun exposure because we can make vitamin D from the sun. Another nutritional concern is dysphagia, um, possible concern. So that should be something that should be followed up on regular checkups with the physician. Um, and as, these, as the disease progresses, it will have an overall impact on, on the oral intake if you're having difficulty swallowing. So you should have a checkup with a speech pathologist to check the progress of need for diet modification. If there is a need for that, the dietitian can help on getting adequate nutrition with the modified diet. Um, and then if it gets to the point where possibly you aren't able to swallow safely without getting some aspiration pneumonia, you might want to think about having a tube, uh, tube placed. G-tube would be the permanent option. Nasogastric tube would be a temporary option. So if it's going to be a lifelong issue, G-tube would be the route to go. And if it's just a poor intake issue, there is some insurance issues with coverage, so dysphagia is definitely one that's covered, but it would be hesitant to set a feeding tube just for poor intake. Um, might not be covered, it might be costly, and there might be some other dietary modifications we can make with the dietitian. And if a feeding tube is placed, you can receive 100% your nutritional needs through the tube. The routes that can be used are through a pump, and that's if you're having gastric issues where you feel like your stomach's not emptying properly, you can have it controlled via pump. Um, another option to have it go a little quicker would be with a gravity bag. And then syringe would be the final option if you're having issues with just digestion or feeling like when you eat you're full for hours, I would say that syringe would be the last option because you might have some discomfort and possible little reflux. And that's it. I'm going to get some questions at the end. Mm -hmm.